I'm kind of hoping it's, it, it's, um, it's good. Um, Me too. We ought to cut um, Ollie some slack here because we are just the practice session because he's going to take this trip <laughs> to Nomadic Walsall. Um, and it's kind of, I just thought that is the coolest thing. I mean, it's like, you know, sort of, that's where I want to go. Yep. Anyway, let, let's welcome Ollie. Thanks. Cheers. It, um, it seems a bit odd to make this a practice talk because I'm pretty sure Monadic Warsaw is about a third the actual size of the audience here, but never mind. I guess it'll definitely be good practice. So uh, it's been, I think, about two years since I last gave a talk at London Haskell. Um, the last one, for those who remember, was on the Pipes Library for dealing with streaming data. And I've certainly been doing a lot of Haskell uh, since I gave that talk, but Despite that, when Derek asked me if I wanted to give a talk, and this was actually before I even committed to talking at Monadic Warsaw, I thought, yeah, definitely want to talk, but I'm not really sure what I'm going to talk about, because uh, I've been doing a lot of experimentations with things like functional reactive programming, building type safe languages, um, but nothing has really solidified enough for me to talk about it for an hour. Um, but a running theme through all of the stuff that I do in Haskell is either uh, guaranteeing that things are going to be correct or somewhat uh, oddly trying to avoid needing to write Haskell in the first place. Um, so I thought it would be fun if we just spend a bit of time reflecting on Haskell as a language and see how it enables me to kind of express a lot of ideas with uh, hopefully very little code. Um, so there's kind of basically going to be three separate talks going on here, which all have a running theme, of course, of uh, less is more, so trying to get more out of less code. Um, first of all, I want to talk about type classes, and I think this is probably going to be material that people are already familiar with, at least for the introduction. But I just want to recap how type classes work and take a bit of time to appreciate what we get from type classes. Um, and there'll be an example there of just using the num type class from the base libraries to do some interesting rearrangements of some simple mathematics. Um, so that's going to take us through uh, some approaches to parametric polymorphism, but I want to look at a different type of polymorphism, which is uh, known as structural polymorphism, uh, which is also known as generic programming. So we'll take a look at um, using the GHC generics library. And then finally, I wanted to look at one different approach, which I'd only ever seen um, after I'd started writing Haskell, which is this idea of uh, building bidirectional parsers. So you might be familiar with the ideas of building parsers out of parser combinators. Bidirectional parsers kind of build on top of this to also give us a pretty printer at the same time. Um, so we've got three separate talks there, so of course feel free to interrupt me at any point. Um, you know, take questions whenever, it'll be much more interesting that way, I think. Um, but before we even look at any of that, why should you even care about what I'm going to talk about? Um, so I think generic programming is uh, beneficial for a lot of reasons. Generic programming and just generally striving to write less code and reduce boilerplate has immediate consequences, I think, for developer productivity. And there's a very immediate uh, productivity win, which is if I have to write less code, um, then one would hope that the time I am spending actually writing code is going to be on the more interesting features of the system rather than just showing the computer how to do something that is otherwise mechanical. And I think that's true, but that's not really the main aspect of productivity gains we get from a generic approach. Uh, I think, for me, one of the really big benefits of taking a generic approach is program correctness. So as Haskell programmers, we all strive to use the type system as much as possible to prove properties about our programs and guarantee that they're going to do something that's somewhat sensible. But there's only so far the type system is going to take us. So a nice example, I think, of generic programming helping us get more correct programs is when we work with uh, serialization and deserialization. So we'll often introduce data types in our program that we want to serialize, for example, to JSON or to save it to the disk. Um, but we also want to make sure that we kind of fully consider all of the data inside that data type. And if we're writing out serialization functions by hand, it's very possible to skip over fields inside a data type because it's very hard to get kind of exhaustive pattern matching um, on data types. However, when we take a generic approach, we can consider independent small primitive serializers and deserializers. Um, and then we can build these together with combinators and we can reason about the small pieces and we can also try and reason about the combinators. Uh, and when we break the problem down into these smaller individual serializers and deserializers, uh, one would hope that uh, all of these pieces fit together very nicely. Ah, sorry, excuse me a second. <laughs> 
So we're also, I think when we get to a generic approach, we're able to end up with some code that's very reusable. So that means uh, if I've built a serializer or a deserializer, I'm going to be able to release this onto Hackage and people are going to be able to reuse this in their programs uh, uh, independent of the data types that they're actually using. Um, so sorry, that's, that was a bit rough, but uh, hopefully this is going to be better when we move into the rest of the talk. So the first thing I wanted to talk about is type classes. So to begin with, uh, let's just consider uh, parametrically polymorphic functions in Haskell. So map is a nice example of a function that exhibits parametric polymorphism. So the map function uh, takes any function from types A to B and also takes a function, uh, it takes a list of values of type A and applies that function to every element in the list. Uh, and there's not a whole lot that map can actually do given this information. Map only has the ability to apply the function once to every element in the list. For example, it can't apply the function multiple times to elements in the list because that wouldn't type check. But usually when we're writing functions that quantify over ranges of types, we don't want to quantify over all possible types. We want to quantify over a subset of types that have some type of operations in common. For example, I might be writing functions that just abstract over uh, things that have numeric properties, so I can add them together or multiply them, for example. Or maybe I'm building some kind of generic uh, web application uh, or web framework where the only thing I care about is that the types could be serialized to JSON. Um, so when we use, and um, we can use type classes to approximate this idea of subsets of types that have some functionality in common. So type classes are going to give us an approach which is similar to interfaces in object-oriented languages. Um, we could imagine in an object-oriented language that we might have interfaces such as enumerable or serializable, and indeed we can replicate that functionality with type classes in Haskell. And it also gives us an approach that's similar to operator overloading in languages such as C++. So we can use type classes to overload the meaning, for example, of addition or multiplication. So we introduce type classes, as I'm sure most people here are aware. Uh, we just use the class keyword. We specify the name of the type class. Uh, and then we're quantifying over variables. So we need to give those types that we're quantifying over a name. So here I've used the type variable A. And then we associate functions with that type class just by providing the signature uh, for those functions that are associated with types of that class. And again, it's worth noting what we don't say about these functions. So I don't specify what the implementation of any of these functions is, um, but I can't even really specify what the intuition behind these functions is, which is a little bit of a shame. So usually we are going to have to leave that up to documentation comments that state the laws that might be associated with this type class. And if we had a richer type system, such as dependent types, we might be able to statically assert those laws as well. But I think Haskell gives us a nice trade-off. Um, so we use type classes just as we would use the ordinary functions. So here I've got a pretty contrived example of a, a, a basic sum that takes some value x and just applies some operations on it. But what's interesting to note is the inferred type for this function. So we actually get a function here that quantifies over all possible types A, um, subject to the constraint that those types are numeric in some sense. And then the last thing we need to do is instantiate these type classes by associating concrete types that provide the implementations for all of these functions. So I'm sure most people are familiar with this. And just to give you one example there, we've got the instance of the num type class for integers. And we would imagine that most of the implementations there are just going to use primitive operations in the GHC runtime system. So everything we've seen there looks a lot like interfaces in other languages, but I think one unique aspect of type classes that's quite subtle and we don't really notice when we're working with them is the ability to associate values with the type class. Um, so when we looked at the num type class, we saw that we had functions that actually took values in and computed with them, um, but we also had the ability to associate just values that have no arguments at all. Um, and I think monoids are a really nice example of this pattern. And of course, it wouldn't be a Haskell talk if I didn't talk about monoids at some point. Um, but if you're unfamiliar with what a monoid is, um, a monoid is this concept that we've got a set of values. We've got an operation that can combine two values in this set to deliver another value in the set. Um, and we've also got a distinguished element in that set, um, which is often called the neutral element, which has no effect on that operation that combines values. So that's quite an abstract or hand-wavy way of looking at this. Um, but to give you a concrete example of a monoid, um, a common one is integers under addition. So given any two integers, we can add them together and we get another integer. 
and we've got the neutral element which is zero because if you add zero to anything uh, it doesn't really make uh, it doesn't have any effect uh, but what's interesting there is uh, so I've got a function here called summarize, which is going to take a list of values of any type. Um, and we have the constraint here that those types must be an instance of the monoid class. Uh, and this is a summar summarizing function in that it gives us some kind of summary of a list. But the interesting pattern to me is what's happening when we give summarize an empty list. So summarize needs to deliver a value of type A. But if we are given an empty list, then we actually have no information that we can compute that value from. But in fact, we do actually have some information, which is the context or the type that we're using summarize in. So by knowing the type, we can then, uh, and we know the constraint that that type has an instance of monoid, we can use the mempty value, which during the code generation and type checking phases, um, we're able to insert what that value is depending on the type we're working under. And I think this is interesting because in any other language, we wouldn't really have this ability to kind of fabricate uh, runtime information just based on the type that we're working under. So we might, uh, in another language, require that a default value gets passed in, but that's going to be quite tedious because now if we use summarize in a smaller function, just one moment, if we use summarize in a, in a kind of inner function somewhere deep inside our program, that information gets propagated all the way outside, um, which becomes quite tedious. Another alternative might be throwing an exception, but again, of course, throwing exceptions isn't great here. Or we might supply some kind of dummy value. But the, the key point there is that we would have to make a choice of what summarize does if it's given the empty list. With a monoid, we get to suspend um, that decision up to the user who is using summarize just in the types. So you were saying it's runtime, but um, I, would, uh, I, I thought it was value level, but compile time. Okay, yeah, so I guess calling it runtime is not strictly true. It's, it's more that as we kind of, yeah, as we try and compute with these functions, knowing the types infers the code generation process. Um, so there's that instance of the uh, monoid for int that I was talking about before. So our map end operation that combines two integers is just addition, and then we have zero as the neutral element. Um, and this already allows us to summarize a list in one way. If you give me a list of any values, I could replace every value in that list with just the literal number one. Um, and then if I take the summary of that under this monoid, we actually get one plus one plus one plus one, which is the length of the list. And indeed, if we give it the empty list, well, we have to deliver back an int. And if we know that we have to deliver an int, then we end up delivering back this zero value uh, due to being able to look up the context of int and knowing that its monoid instance has zero as the neutral element. Um, but we probably, if we're going to summarize a list, we want to take a summary knowing more information about the values inside that list. So there are two other possible choices of monoid. Uh, if we know that the elements in that list have an ordering and they have greatest and least bounds, then there are two possible monoids we could use for those values. So one possible choice of monoid is the minimum operation. So given any two values that are orderable, I can find you the minimum, uh, element, uh, minimum value from those two. And that has a neutral element, which is the maximum possible value for that type. But we have a limitation in Haskell, which is that um, we can only have one instance of a type class per type. So there are two possible choices of monoid here, and I wouldn't be able to, to specify both of them. However, what we can do is simply introduce new types into our program. So new types are kind of uh, types that are used in order to guide the type checking process and the type class resolution system, but they have no runtime representation. So we're not paying a cost for using new types. So I can introduce a new type here for min, which wraps up any value. So min quantifies over all types A, and its monoid instance adds the assumptions or the constraints that A has an ordering and it has uh, greatest and least bounds. And then I can construct a monoid over these minimum values by using the min operation and using max bound as a neutral element. Um, but what if I want to find both the maximum and the minimum of a list at the same time? So in an imperative language, that seems like a pretty straightforward problem. We just have two temporary variables, and as we walk over this list, we update one of the variables to contain the running minimum and one of them to contain the running maximum. But that's kind of requiring that I go in and I change the definition of this summarize function. A nicer way to do this is by using the property that monoids compose. So given any two monoids, I can actually form another monoid out of them by taking uh, the product or the pair of both of these monoids. 
And indeed, pairing is described in Haskell by just using a tuple of uh, two types. And then we have a monoid instance here that assumes that both the left and the right types of the tuple are monoidal. And then the map end operation just operates over it pairwise. So indeed, I can now summarize over this. I've got a list here of 1 to 10. And if I replace every element in this list with a tuple of min and max, so we're going to get min 1, max 1, min 2, max 2, and so on. When I apply summarize over that, we uh, collapse all of this information down to just get the minimum and the uh, maximum from the list. I think there's something interesting in this kind of pattern of using a type class in this sense. It almost, to me, um, looks a lot like mathematical induction. So monoid A and monoid B, in the context of this instance, almost act like induction hypotheses. And then the monoid instance for the tuple itself is like the inductive step. And then our monoid instances for min, for max, uh, for int that I showed you before, all form base cases for this induction principle. So on the one hand, this gives us a reasoning process to reason about how these type classes might interact. It also influences the instance resolution process. So as we give it an instance, uh, sorry, we give it a value, for example, that's a pair of min and max, we never specified an instance for pairs of min and max, but we did specify the more general instance that we can recurse down with this kind of induction process. Uh, so that's just what I wanted to recap for type classes. So uh, when we use type classes, the requirements are added to the context of the function. We provide instances which teaches the compiler about possible implementations for those functions. And as it goes through the type checking process and performs unification of types, we know which implementation to actually use. Um, the solving and the constraint resolution, I think, can be thought of as either constraint solving, but also it's almost a form of automatic proof search. So we saw that when we use the neutral element from monoids, we were just inferring a value based on the type that it appeared in. And indeed, when we have richer types that can contain even more information, when we infer those values, we can infer some quite particular values. Um, and this actually becomes more useful when we start doing things like emulating dependent types in Haskell, and we start working with things like singleton types. And uh, by providing instances that depend on others, I think we have this uh, process that looks a lot like mathematical induction, which already gives me a way to begin to reason about how these instances might interact. So now I wanted to give you an example of just doing some interesting stuff with the num type class. Um, so to give you a bit of context, this is just a project I was working on a while ago. Um, and I think it's easiest if I demonstrate this with a fairly badly shot video. But hopefully, some of this will come across clearly. Just a quick demo of something I've been working on for, well, I guess today in the last couple of days. You see, in the bottom of the screen, there's a little green cube. And I am actually not interacting with this cube from the keyboard mouse, but rather I am using a button. So down here, I don't know how long you can see that. Uh, I'm going to go across. Hammer and contact with pedals. So if I. Uh, actually start pedaling, uh, we'll now see that the cube is moving. And of course, if I put even more force through the paddles, then the cube tends even faster. And of course, if I back off a little bit, the cube's going to slow down. So, yeah, it's a, uh, a basic start of getting a video game controlled by my bike, which should be quite fun. We'll see. So yeah, that's, uh, that's a general idea. Unfortunately, it didn't really develop much beyond a spinning cube. Um, <laughs> but hopefully, I'm going to pick that up at one point and develop them to saying a bit more. But, um, so that's the idea. So I've got an indoor bicycle. It's got a bunch of sensors on it. But the important sensor is what's called a power meter. Um, so in the sense of classical mechanics, I have a way to measure power, that is, the rate of work being done on the bike. Um, so the first thing I need to do to build this simulation is to come up with a suitable mathematical model. Uh, so I can, yeah, as like I said, I can use classical mechanics, and I'm basically going to build this around the equation that power is the product of force and velocity. So in my model, I get to choose what the forces are that are acting against a cyclist. And for this simple model, I'm just using the sum of the force of gravity. So moving up a hill requires me to overcome some extra forces. Uh, but more importantly, the force of drag. So as I move through the air, I have to displace that air. Um, and that's an interesting force because it itself is a function of velocity. Um, so what that means is as I'm moving fast, if I want to accelerate and move even faster, it requires more and more power. 
which, as somebody who races regularly at the weekends, is all too aware of that fact, unfortunately. Um, so that translates very nicely into Haskell. So I think this translation is almost a one-to-one -one translation of those uh, formulas I showed you before, and it's kind of the code you'd see in chapter one of any kind of introduction to Haskell textbook. But the interesting thing to note here is not so much the definitions of these functions, but more it's the types are quantified over any instances of floating types. So any types that have the operations of sine, arctangent, uh, multiplication, and addition, and so on, um, I can plug into these equations. But we have a bit of a problem. Um, I can measure power, and what I've showed you so far is functions that would calculate power. So we need to solve these equations in, in order to find out what the velocity is at that certain power level. And one thing I could do is take an analytical approach and try and find a closed solution there, um, which would require rearranging things. And that's certainly doable. It's not going to be particularly fun because um, in that power equation, we saw that power is a function of velocity cubed. But more importantly, that's just more work than I actually want to do. That would require me to write more code, and I've already got a model that I'd like to reuse. So a different way we could do this is to use numerical methods. And in numerical methods, we're able to find an approximation for velocity uh, given a known power and some known forces. And one very simple numerical method is Newton's method or the newton raphson method, uh, which begins with an approximation of where we think a root is, that is a zero point, on any arbitrary real valued function. And then we iterate from this best approximation, hopefully finding better and better approximations as to where a zero occurs on the function. And it's captured by what I think is a pretty simple recurrence relation there. And I can come up with a suitable definition of f, a suitable function f, that I want to solve to find uh, zero points on. So if I'm able to measure a known power, uh, I can have a function of velocity that would calculate the power output at that velocity, and I find the difference of that and the, and the power that I'm measuring right now. And eventually, when I find a suitable approximation for velocity, this will converge to zero because my model will calculate a power that's equal to the power that I'm actually measuring. But we have a problem here in that we need to know what the derivative of f is. It turns out that that problem is actually going to be slightly more tractable um, because calculating derivatives and performing differentiation is a very systematic process that we know how to do. Uh, and the AD library on Hackage captures that systematic approach to differentiation and encodes it into a Haskell library. So the idea behind AD, which stands for automatic differentiation, is to evaluate functions at specific points in their domain, but at the same time evaluate the function for its first order derivative at that same point. So here I've got uh, diff prime, which comes from the AD library, and I've given it the function x squared. I can evaluate that at the point x equals 4, and I get back 16, as we'd expect, because 4 squared is indeed 16. But also, at the same time, I can find the first order derivative of the function x squared, that is 2x at the point x equals 4, and at that point, uh, the, the derivative will be 8. But again, it's important to note here that diff prime knows nothing about this function that's being given to it. Um, there's no annotations here, there's no particular syntax that's specific to automatic differentiation. Diff prime is able to work on any function that just uses the operations of the num and the floating type class. And we'll see how that happens in a moment. Uh, but I just want to finish up by demonstrating that we can now use this to build what I think is an extremely beautiful example of Haskell code. So here is an encoding of Newton's method in Haskell using automatic differentiation. So at the top, we've got the original recurrence relation that we saw before. And down here, um, we're using that as a function to iterate, which it will repeatedly apply this function here. So we start with an original guess, and then we can apply uh, diff prime to our function at our current guess, which is going to give us both a value of the function fxn, but also a value of the derivative of that function at the same point. And then we can feed this in here, and we see this is exactly the same as Newton's method we saw above. And iterate is going to repeatedly feed these values back into itself to find better and better approximations, but it'll also give me back a list of increasingly better approximations. And one thing to also note there is that list is going to be constructed lazily. So if I only need, for example, the third approximation from this, I'm only going to pay for three steps of work. Sorry, does that really compute the um, differential? The, uh, differential there? 
so, well, so the point is you're not ever kind of calculating a uh, the, the derivative function. You you're just calculating points. Oh, it's a yeah. numeric method inside diff. Or uh, well, it's not really a numeric method. We'll see the implementation of how it works oh, yeah, in a moment. Right. But essentially, you're going to be running the function through to get uh, a value at the end. So I can put all of this together to calculate the velocity for a known power. I have my parameters of gradient and weight and the power that I'm measuring from the bicycle. And then I can use that function f I showed you before that finds the difference between a calculated power output at a certain velocity and that power that I'm measuring from the bicycle. So here I've started with an initial guess of 5 meters per second and I've taken the sixth approximation there. Um, Obviously, in the actual code I was doing, I, I wanted to control for some error bounds. Um, but if we plug in some sample values there, so the velocity for power moving up a 5% gradient, uh, assuming the rider weighs 61 kilos and can put out 200 watts of power, uh, this approximates, at least according to this model, that they'll be moving at around 20 kilometers an hour. And that's slightly optimistic from my real world testing, but it's not far off the measure. Um, and the nice thing here is I can now go back and refine that model that I was using in order to calculate this without needing to change any other code. So in reality, there are more forces acting against me as a cyclist, such as rolling resistance or efficiency losses in the bicycle. So I could model those by changing the resisting forces function, and all of this code continues to make sense. So I can rapidly iterate on this without having to find, for example, new derivatives or new closed form expressions for velocity. So how does this actually work then? So AD comes with a type called forward double, which is the pairing of two double precision numbers. Uh, the first one of these is just going to be the output of the function at any point. But the second function carries the derivative of the function at the same time. And the interesting stuff happens when we uh, provide the implementations of what addition and multiplication means for these numbers. So when we add two forward doubles together, we add, uh, I suppose it's easier here, we add these two uh, numbers A and B together, that's just evaluating the function, but we also add together uh, their derivatives as well, which is, as we know, that's how you, if you were finding the derivative of the sum of two functions, that is the sum of its derivatives. However, for multiplication, things are slightly more interesting. So to find the value of the function under multiplication, we just times the two numbers together as we would. But here, we're actually seeing the product rule for derivatives being applied directly as we do this multiplication. So the same idea is carried uh, throughout the rest of the type classes. It also provides an implementation for calculating sine and cosine and knowing um, what the derivatives of those functions are. Uh, and the reason we can use this is because our calculate power output function was polymorphic. Um, because we didn't specify what the type of number was, we can plug in this more interesting type of number in order to calculate both values of the function at specific points, but also values of the derivative at specific points as well. Um, so that's what I wanted to talk about for type classes. Type classes can certainly do a whole lot more than that. Um, more than I could cover in one talk for sure, maybe more than a whole lecture series probably. Um, but to give you a couple of terms that you might want to Google if you want to see other uses of type classes, um, there's finally tagless encodings, which is a way to specify domain-specific languages. Um, it itself is a specific way of doing domain-specific languages, but in the work there uh, by Oleg, he varies the interpretation of languages based on type classes. So we move the syntax of a language into a type class, and then various different types um, give us things like evaluators, pretty printers, and so on. Um, when we introduce the extensions multi-parameter type classes and functional dependencies, type classes actually begin to act more like relations between types. So we can start to use uh, type classes to do type-level programming. Um, we've seen that type classes can have values and functions associated with them. If we enable the type families extension, we also get the ability to associate types with type classes. Uh, and this can be useful if we're, for example, modeling an object relational mapper or something like that, where we would need to talk about data types that can be serialized into a database. And we might want to associate the type of, for example, the primary key of a data type. And we could do this with the type families extension. And there's a couple of extensions here that extend on the instance resolution process. 
So when GHC has to work out the possible instance, type class instance for a given type, it's quite conservative how it does that search. And we can open that up with the extensions overlapping instances and undecidable instances, um, which is usually useful when we're starting to do more interesting type level programming. So a couple of things that you might want to search for there. Um, so that's it for type classes. Uh, next, I want to have a look at GHC generics. So that was uh, a type of polymorphism known as parametric polymorphism. But there are other ways we can be polymorphic over the data types we accept to our functions. And all the way back in November 2011, GHC 7.2 got a new extension which is called Derive Generic. And that enables us to do what is known as generic programming. So generic programming is the idea that any data type can be represented out of a small family of simpler data types. And the kit that we get uh, in GHC generics, as I call it, is uh, we have data types that represent the individual fields in a data type. We have a data type that represents lists of fields. And we have another data type that represents the list of possible constructors for a data type. And the idea is that all or perhaps more like 90% of all data types that we work with can be represented in just these simple types. And we can use these types to kind of form a tree, which we're going to see shortly. Uh, and then we can just recur through that tree in a very generic sense. GHC Generics also has the ability to tag this with metadata, which can be useful if we're doing things like serialization, where we want to attach the field names, for example, or the original data type names. So I think it's easiest to understand the idea of these representation types if we look at it diagrammatically. Um, so here I've got the maybe type, which uh, a lot of people are probably familiar with. And the representation of the maybe type is the choice of two constructors. So we can see this node here introduces the choice. On the one hand, we use u1, which is a unary constructor that is a constructor that contains no information. And that corresponds to the nothing constructor to the maybe data type. And on the right hand side, we have uh, this rec0a node, which is basically a reference to any value of type a. And that corresponds to the just a constructor. Another example of these representation types uh, is for this record. So I have a record type here called talk, which represents a talk such as the one I'm giving right now. And its representation is essentially just a list of strings. So we can see with this colon star colon operator, we've kind of got the spine of a list. And the leaves of this representation represent the individual strings that are inside this talk data type. And the actual representation that GHC Generics is going to give us is annotated with a little bit more metadata as well. So at the top, we've got this D1 node, which indicates the name of the data type. We've got a C1 node, which indicates the name of the constructor, which is talk. Um, and then also down here, for each of these kind of free leaf trees, I suppose, we've got some metadata about the selector name. And then finally, we have the strings inside the data type. Um, so we can use these generic representations to traverse through them in a sense that's independent of the data types themselves. Uh, so I wanted to give you an example here of taking one of these records and uh, encoding it as a JSON object. So the plan is I'm going to take any one of these records and I'm going to assume that every field in the record can already be serialized to JSON. Uh, and if that assumption holds, then I can provide a JSON object where uh, every key value in the JSON object comes from a field in the record type itself. And the idea is I'm going to kind of work bottom up from this tree. So every time I get to one of these rec0 string subtrees, I'm able to construct a, a, essentially a singleton JSON object, a JSON object that has one key value pair. And every time I move up to one of these colon star colon nodes, I just recurs down the left tree, recurs down the right tree, and combine both of those lists into a larger JSON object. <coughs> and eventually, when I get to the top of this tree, I will have collected all key value pairs for all fields in the data type, and I can turn that out into JSON and render it to a string if I needed to. So it's slightly kind of unidiomatic, I suppose, the way you write these traversals in GHC generics. So normally when we're working with tree structures and so on in Haskell, we would pattern match in a single function definition. But the problem is these representation types, as we traverse through them, the types of them change. In order to capture the fact that these types change, we have to actually do pattern matching in a slightly different way, which is to kind of characterize the traversal with a type class. And then every time we want to pattern match on different parts of this representation tree, we provide instances of this type class that match various parts of the tree. Uh, 
So the, the simplest is if we start at the base case here, which is for single fields. So the instance head of this uh, type class instance for uh, record fields matches on S1 nodes, where we have some metadata containing the field name, and we also have one of these rec0a nodes, which um, we also have the assumption here that that can be turned into JSON. So that's going to represent a single field in our record data type. And to collect the record fields from our single field, we just build a singleton list and pair up the name of the selector for that field along with the JSON encoding of the value inside that field. For lists of fields, we're going to be working with this colon star colon uh, node. And for that, I now need to assert that both the left and the right part of this node can also be traversed to find all of the, the record fields that exist inside it. So if I can traverse both the left and the right subtree of this representation node, um, then I can indeed find all record fields underneath it by traversing the left, traversing the right, and then using a list append uh, function to combine those two lists into one. So again, I think here we see that kind of shape of uh, induction happening again. Our induction hypothesis this time is that we could traverse the left subtree and the right subtree, and then the induction step is assuming that these hypotheses hold, I can then show that the product of two subtrees is also traversable to find all fields of a record. And then we put all of this together with a function that kind of just kicks things off. Um, so this function record to object is polymorphic over all types A, subject to the constraints that A is both generic, that is I can view its generic representation, but also that whatever its representation happens to be, I can traverse that to find the individual fields of the record. Uh, the body of the function is to just immediately uh, enter under this representation type with two, I then pass this representation to record fields, which is going to give me back a list of key value pairs, uh, where the values are all JSON objects. And then I can pass this over to the ASIN object function, which constructs an object in the JSON syntax tree. And indeed, we can try this out. So here's the talk that I'm giving right now. And if I call record to object on this, we indeed get a JSON object, which contains three properties, which are the three properties of that talk record itself. But nothing in the type of record to object talks about the fact that I'm giving a talk at all, and indeed nothing in the talk data type talks about how to turn it into JSON. So we're able to separate those concerns uh, just by being able to work with this, the representation of what is kind of inside the talk data type. So for the instance resolution process, uh, I just wanted to show you how we're actually getting um, the record fields out of the talk data type, seeing as we never actually provided instances for anything that was particular to that data type. Um, so the first thing that happens when we look at the representation of a talk is that we begin with one of these uh, colon star colon nodes. And indeed, we do have an instance to traverse the record fields of this node, assuming that we know how to traverse both the left and the right subtrees to find the fields there. So the type checker is going to continue and it explores the two sides of that subtree and we see on the left hand side we have the talk author field and we have an instance that matches there but on the right hand side we have another one of these colon star colon nodes so we have to consider both of its left and right subtrees. And if we do that, we again witness that we've got more of these uh, uh, cell one nodes which represent the individual fields of the data type. Uh, so in which case we now certainly do have type class instances for all possible parts of this subtree. And then we can begin our bottom-up traversal where we end up pairing the field name and field value for every field in the record. And then we can combine all of this together to deliver that final JSON object. Um, so there's a whole lot more that we can do with generics. I think serialization and deserializes is just the kind of almost prototypical example or maybe one of the most common uses of generics, but they can do a lot more than that. So command line parsers are one thing we can write with generic programming. I think that was earlier this year, or maybe at the end of last year, Gabriel Gonzalez released a library called OptPass Generic, um, which is able to generically derive a parser for the command line arguments when we're running things in the command line. So all we need to do is specify a data type of the possible options or parameters to the program. And given that information, uh, that library can generically derive a nice human readable um, way to interact with that program at the command line. We can derive some of the more standard base instances like monoid and semigroup. Um, 
I showed you earlier that the tuple of two types that are monoidal is indeed a monoid itself, and that actually carries forward to the product of an arbitrary amount of types. Uh, and that's exploited in the generic deriving library. We could generate test data using quick checks, some more serialization, some more pretty printing. Uh, we can do ON sorting, which is a kind of interesting application of generics. Um, so we're used to sorting usually being at best case ON log N, but that's if we only know a partial ordering on the types. If we actually know more than a partial ordering on the types, then it's possible to get ON sorting. And that's the idea behind radix sorts. And the discrimination library exploits this by generically kind of applying a radix sort to all parts of our data type. Um, there's the ability to construct tries or trees, however you want to pronounce it, uh, generically. So the, tree, uh, the, the key of any of these trees uh, can be any data type that's generic. And there's also some serialization to Postgres rows as they come over the wire. Um, for a, a more detailed talk on GHC generics, I'd point you to probably to Andres Lowe's talk. Um, I don't know the exact title of it, but it's a skills matter talk. So I think if you search skills matter and Andres Lowe, you should be able to find it. Um, there's a library called OneLiner, which does indeed allow you to write these functions as one line at the cost that it looks somewhat difficult to follow exactly what's going on. Um, but that might be quite fun if you want to explore other ways to use GHC generics. And there's a couple of other generics libraries that use different representation types. So the representation used by GHC generics is just one possible way to represent data types out of a small family. Um, there's generics SOP, which uses a lot more uh, type level programming to form its representations. And there's also instant generics, which I think predates GHC generics, but has a slightly better story for working with GADTs. Uh, and then finally, the last thing I wanted to look at is this idea of bidirectional parsers. So we've seen that we could generically derive serializers or JSON encoders for record types. And we would hope then, in a similar fashion, we could generically derive a deserializer that takes JSON and translates it into Haskell objects. And because we've built these things out of small pieces, that is our representation trees, we might be able to reason that each of these individual subparsers is doing the correct thing, and therefore that our serializers and our deserializers are mutual inverses of each other. Um, so a generic approach gives hope that we could write serializers and deserializers that are, that are compatible, but it does force people to use generic representations. So um, I'd ask, is there another way we could guarantee that both serializers and deserializers match up? So the idea in bidirectional programming, or bidirectional parsers, is we basically pair up every parsing function with its equivalent pretty printer. So we start out much like we do with parser combinators with a small parser for, say, integers, or booleans, or in, uh, individual characters. And each of those comes with a pretty printer for pretty printing booleans or pretty printing a single character. And then we also have some <coughs> composition operators that build larger parsers from these smaller ones while also building larger pretty printers at the same time. So to give you a concrete example of this, there's a library called WebRoots Boomerang, which uh, uses this in the particular context of routing URLs in web applications. So the idea in WebRoots Boomerang is we start with a data type, which describes all possible routes in our application. And then we derive these so-called bidirectional boomerang parsers for every constructor in that data type. And then we compose these boomerangs to make a bigger boomerang, and I suppose at that point the analogy falls down a little bit, uh, but the idea is we're composing these parsers to build a larger parser, um, but also while we're building these parsers, we're also building a function that knows how to render independent routes in our sitemap to strings. So to give you an example of this in action, uh, I've got a basic sitemap here which represents a, a small version of Hackage. So our Hackage website has a home page. We can find the details of a single package, uh, and that's parameterized by a string, which is going to be the name of the package. And then we also have a root in our application, which is the list of packages that an author has made. So that ADT describes all possible routes in our site. And then, uh, so there's nothing specific about routing there. And then the next thing I need to do is to derive those boomerangs for each of these constructors. Uh, and that's just done with a line of template Haskell. And that's going to generate some functions for each of the constructors that look a little bit like this. Um, so we get these boomerangs, our home, our package details, and so on. 
And it's not so important to worry about E and TOC as parameters there, but what's happening is these last two parameters act a little bit like a kind of function space for these boomerangs. So for example, the home uh, constructor took no information, so it's almost like it's a function here of no arguments whatsoever. However, the package details router uh, does take a string. So if we're going to route the package details, we need to work out which package we're trying to list the details for. So the first thing we see here is a string. And if we are able to parse that string out, then we'll be able to apply this and get a package sitemap back out. Um, so this funny operator here is basically acting like a kind of stack cons operator. Um, and building a stack is how Boomerang is able to, to do this. But I don't really want to go into too much of the details of how Boomerang is working. Um, so now we've got these constructors for the independent routes in our data type. We just need to compose them to build a larger router. And we've got a couple of ways that we can compose these Boomerangs together. So, uh, we've got monoidal composition, which allows us to introduce a choice between parsers. We've got category composition, which chains composers together. So that is, it tries to consume t some tokens from the stream or produce some tokens if we're rendering out. And then we've also got this forward slash operator, which is a little bit like function application. So it introduces a forward slash in the URL, and it's assumed that things to the right of that forward slash are applied as arguments to roots in our sitemap. And we can also add literal URL parts by providing the individual strings, and they're going to be parsed uh, kind of verbatim, but also rendered back out exactly as they are. So I can build a router for this hackage sitemap then out of the choice of our three possible routes. We've got the home route, which requires no parsing and no pretty printing whatsoever. So that corresponds just to uh, the completely empty string. If we see more than the empty string, then that parser will fail, so we use a monoid operation here to combine it with some other routers. So the next possible choice is that we read the string package, and if we do read the string package, then we can start working under this package details constructor. That requires a string, as we saw um, for the type of our package details, so we use any string which uh, just takes the rest of the URL and builds uh, the root from that string. And likewise, when we're rendering this, our package details knows how to extract that string from the package details constructor and render it out into the root if we're rendering URLs. And then our final choice is to do the same thing for authors. So if we see the string author, we then also need to uh, parse a forward slash and parse the rest of the string, or render a forward slash and the name of the author. So we can now run this router in two directions. So if I try and parse the forward slash root, that's going to parse as the root home, as we would expect. We could try and parse the root forward slash author, and then we actually get a parse error. And interestingly, we also get a parse error that tells us what we should be expecting, which is quite nice. Certainly, you probably wouldn't want to present this to users of the application, but it's nice to have this in your debug logs. Um, so we get a parse error there that the end of the string was unexpected. And indeed, if we do specify an author of some Haskell packages, um, then we get the author packages root. And in this case, it's for Ed. So if I was rendering the list of packages for Ed, um, I'd probably want to link to at least the lens library. So I can do this in the opposite direction by constructing one of those elements of the package sitemap uh, data type. And then I use the render function, which is going to render that out as a string. Um, and now we've got the properties that these strings can indeed be, be, be parsed back into roots. Um, so some resources there. I think the original publication that the Boomerangs library was built around um, is by Rendell and Osterman. Um, the paper there, Invertible Syntax Descriptions. And the idea there is they work with this category, I think they call it the category of partial isomorphisms. And then they build up some vocabulary like functor and applicative within this category, which gives them an applicative combinator that works a lot like parser combinators, but also carries this inverse, which happens to be a pretty printer. So we've got the Boomerang library on Hackage. There's JSON Grammar, which takes a similar approach, but is actually for deriving deserializers and serializers for JSON. And I've also got a blog post that I did a while ago, which is, again, it's the same kind of ideas, um, but I took a slightly different approach using heterogeneous lists in GHC, which weren't available when um, WebRoots Boomerang was invented. Uh, and that's on my blog, and that's using uh, binary serializers and deserializers. Um, so that's everything I wanted to talk about. So there's three separate topics there, but hopefully you got to see that theme of um, 
being able to write programs declaratively and then view them in various different ways. So when we looked at type classes, I had uh, some mathematical formulas and I was able to view them both for their value at, function, uh, at points in the domain, but also uh, find their derivatives. And then I could use that to use Newton's method and some numerical methods to do some interesting stuff. We also saw GHC generics being independent of the shape of data types themselves, and we derived a basic JSON encoder for anything that was a record. And then finally, we saw how with WebRoots Boomerang, we can build routing tables for web applications and view them in two directions. Um, so there's certainly many other ways that Haskell as a language will allow you to not need to write as much Haskell, um, but those were three that came to mind that I remember having a lot of fun um, reading and exploring about, and hopefully some of that's come across in this talk. Um, so we've probably got a load of time for questions. Yep. In the first part of your talk, you used some uh, kind of theory jargon that I had heard before, but that I don't know the precise definition of. You said, you said two things. You said quantify over Okay. okay. Uh, and then you also use the word type unification. I'm kind of curious if you can explain this in like MS terms. Yeah, so the idea of quantification is just a fancy way of saying that it works for a range of types essentially. So we have in type theory we usually have two quantifiers. We have existential quantification and for all quantification. Haskell doesn't really have a very good story for existentials, at least in function types. So really all I'm saying there when I'm saying that it quantifies over types is that it works for all possible types. Uh, and for the example of calculate power output there, it, it is a function defined for all types, but you're only going to be able to uh, provide values there that have a type that is an instance of the floating type class. So when I say quantification, I'm really just talking about the all possible types that would be appropriate there. Um, and for unification types, I'm just talking about the process of doing type checking. Um, so when we have this function resisting forces, for example, we don't know what the type is. But when we use that in the context of applying some values to it, we will know the type of those values, which will then allow us to work out what the type variables A happens to be used at. So it's kind of like the, the process of finding out what those type variables mean when we use them. So you unify A with yeah, flow or forward double in the example of doing Newton's method. Uh, yes, I think you will pay a slight runtime cost there. So uh, when you use derived generic, you get an instance of a type class called generic. And that has two functions that uh, one goes into this generic representation, and that's going to pattern match on the data type you give it and construct one of these trees. So there will be an in-memory representation of that representation type, if that makes sense. If you use a uh, the automated instances with two JSON from JSON, these things that I think use generics, mm -hmm. uh, why would you have to create an instance of to JSON rather than just using the two generic and then like cap, like uh, compose that with two JSON. In other words, why do they create, uh, or is it just because? You're saying why have instances that rely on generics? Yeah, I mean, if you have something that's going to use generics pretty much across the board, why why bother slapping it onto the object as opposed to saying go to generic first and then go to JSON? Function that just takes any generic and right, okay. Uh, you could certainly do that, and there's certainly times in my code where I'll be working with some data that I know has a generic instance, and providing type classes is just not, there's not really any benefit to doing it. So I do break data types apart into their generic representations just kind of on an ad hoc basis. Um, I think the nice thing with the way that ASIN are doing it is it gives you a very unified approach to how to access these encoders and decoders. Uh, I'm not entirely sure if I agree with the to JSON and from JSON type classes anyway, because there's no guarantee that they really mean anything sensible because they're two separate type classes. Um, so maybe the functions would be a better way of doing it. Um, but we do have the problem though that then that function would only be usable with things that are generic. And you might have a data type that somebody else gave you that's not generic. But it is an instance of two JSON. Well, might not be fast enough for you, and you, you might want to hang back your own for right, a, 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 a Yeah. Sorry, 
or you just want to wrap it to a different uh, JSON representation for the same values? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, if you were doing different JSON representations, that might you could either use new types, or you could just you could just use functions well, as well. Once you use new type, the you lose the generic, or it would be the same generic representation, and you would not want to use the, the generated one. Yeah. Want to use your, your own one. Right. I'm not sure if new types carry. Well, I don't think you can derive generic for them, yes. and if you can, you just get one field. That's exactly. Yeah. The yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, can you do generics? Uh, Programming on like types themselves. I'm thinking like uh, an application, much like uh, Web Road Boomerang, mm -hmm. applied to like seven routes, where each route is actually uh, multiple types combined together. Um, so you wanna you wanna break those types apart into some other yeah. representation. So if I, I basically like get the URL representation of where I <coughs> just have the type of the route. So I don't know if there's any generics type functions. Um, I mean, the best way we can do this right now is with type families. So we would be able to compute different interpretations of maybe the various routes using a type family. That might be one way of doing it, but that's not a generic approach. So you're going to have to basically kind of type level pattern match on every possible route at the type level. Um, maybe using the singletons library, you could write your own kind of generic representation type. It wouldn't be GHC generics, but you might be able to write a representation type that's suitable for the work you're doing and then um, by wrapping that up in singletons you would have it at the type level as well. Um, possibly. <laughs> Not entirely sure if that works. I think got one more. What's the connection between the bidirectional query stuff you're doing in prisms? Um, so so prisms, for those who aren't aware, are um, some vocabulary from the Lens library that lets you, um, you can kind of pattern match on the individual constructors of a data type, but you might also be able to construct that data type if you have just the information of one constructor. Uh, and there is a connection there, and I use that in my blog post, and that's, I kind of use the prism as my representation type. Um, so when a lot of these bidirectional libraries, the idea is you break data down into like a list of its independent fields, and I use a prism to get that kind of list representation. Uh, and there's another library, uh, I can't remember what it is, it's used by the JSON grammar library though, which is another type of prism that uses uh, more inductive structure than tuples. So prisms normally are just a tuple of all the fields, which is useless to recurse on. So there is another library that gives you a kind of list of fields inside the uh, value. So there's certainly a connection, but I think there's still kind of two separate concepts. Um, yeah, I was just wondering if these bidirectional parsers uh, as powerful as like standard unidirectional ones. Are you restricted in the current parsers? Yeah. Um, so all I've seen in the work on bidirectional parsers so far is going as far as applicative. Um, so you're not going to get that context-dependent parsing that you would get with monadic parser combinators. But I think if you've got, uh, certainly in web routes, if you've got context-dependent URL routes, those might be some pretty crazy routes anyway, and pretty hard to document, if you're, at least if you're expo exporting an API. Um, so at least for routing tables, I find applicative is pretty much the sweet spot. <laughs> 